Welcome to The Mentor, I'm Mark Boris. Within the last couple of years, we've seen an interesting movement play out as the rise of the passive investor takes flight, particularly amongst young people. Millennials and Gen Zers are more invested in the stock market than any other financial asset. The surge of younger investors into the market, at least here in Australia anyway, has been driven in part by Spaceship and other new entrants offering low fees. Spaceship Voyager is a micro-investing app and has become a destination for young people who are looking to make an investment in a simple and easy way. Investors can choose to invest in three different portfolios with the ability to deposit lump sums or set up regular weekly, fortnightly or monthly top-ups. Andrew Moore is the CEO of Spaceship and was put into the role in 2019. With a long background in traditional banking, including General Electric Company, then Wizard Home Loans, where I first met Andrew, then Westpac and Sir George, he stepped into a fast-moving fintech. Andrew and I discuss how to connect and empower your target customer, how to dismantle traditional barriers to entry and educate customers to set them up for success. And it's all about the experience. So let's get into it. Andrew Moore, welcome to The Mentor. Thank you. Great to be here. Finally, mate. Yes, indeed. Well, I, I, I got to declare um, I'm an Andrew Moore fan. Um, we go back a long, long time to about 2004. But Round about the, then, that's, right. that's 2004. Beginning 2005. Um, uh, Andrew in those days was a General Electric, um, had a long career there um, and then uh, became the CEO of Wizard after my ownership but during my chairmanship. That's right. So that's right. And uh, did a brilliant job. And uh, by the way, he was a big star at General Electric. But right now, the CEO of Spaceship. Do you call them customers? Inde- indeed, or astronauts or uh, astronauts. <laughs> fellow space travellers, whatever it happens to but be. But they're, yeah. they're effectively the customers, aren't That's they? right, the yes. Day, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and we'll talk about that business uh, a little bit later, um, Spaceship a little bit later. Uh, but I want to talk about Andrew Moore a little bit. Uh, so he looks like he's about 18, but he's a little bit older than that. Um, he's just somehow he's, he's discovered this uh, magic of being able to stay forever young. I don't know how, he's, how the hell he's done it, but he's done it. Take me back. Where did Andrew Moore grow up? Uh, wow, we're really going back. So uh, I, I was born of Australian parents in the UK. So right. technically, UK, a pommy. pommy, yeah, which is wow. Uh, well, that I, explains I keep a that few pretty, things. This might be the only time I've actually publicly acknowledged that. You were so never this let is Paul a Ryan or Brad Seymour know that back but, in the old oh, days. Never. <laughs> uh, then moved to uh, when the family moved back to Australia. Moved to Port Hedland, red dust country. Wow. Up in uh, my dad was in the mining industry, and he subsequently moved into the uh, financial services industry for a while. But mining was really his his love and background, and. Then the family went to Perth. I started my schooling in Perth, did most of my schooling in Adelaide, uh, which is where I think of as, as having grown up. It sort of feels a little bit like a hometown to me, but I've, I've never lived there since I finished school at the age of 16. And did you go to moons ago. Went to uni at ANU yep. uh, in Canberra back, back in the days when ANU was this sort of thing that no one really knew about and wasn't terribly fashionable at all, I think. But uh Went there to study. Uh, I ended up doing both a science degree, majoring in psychology, and and uh, also an economics degree. And I, and I always laugh and say that the the really valuable degree for my my commercial career has been the psychology degree, totally. not the economics. Well, degree. particularly working at General Electric, um, yeah. because you've got to be psychologists <laughs> working in those sorts of places, um, because you've got to understand how the how the system works. That's right. So where, but you, but you've had an amazing career. You had a I mean, I, I soon recall you were a, a, a black belt Six Sigma person. Well, that, is that correct? Yeah, well, that uh, which has nothing, of course, to do with my martial arts capability. No, no but, and we <laughs> might explain what that is in a second. Yeah, we, we, we will because that, that was part of the GE uh, yep. part of the story. But, but for me, when I left uni, I, I, tr- I, I went down quite a traditional route, I would say. I, I joined a, a big chartered accounting firm, Coopers and Librand, now uh, part of PricewaterhouseCoopers. Uh, so I was doing the chartered accounting thing. But for one of, that's of one of the big firms. Though. That would have been a top four or top six. Oh, firm very much days. so. Very much Globally. so. Globally. Yeah, and, and uh, joined their, their corporate finance um, area there and that created an opportunity to move into investment banking and then I worked in the early 90s with Bankers Trust which at that point in time may not be known to, to some people that weren't around at the time but was a, a leading investment bank and an in, in, in investment business in the in the day 
uh, and had a, had a tremendous time working there and working very much on transactions, um, M&A transactions, uh, equity capital raising transactions. It was a just learned a tremendous amount working with an incredibly very talented group of people. Business uh, BT was a very aggressive, acquisitive business. Very much with so. With access to funds. Very much so. I mean, and, I mean, big corporate funds I'm talking about. That's right. And, and the, the history of it in Australia is when when the, the business globally was actually bought out by Deutsche Bank, the Australian business sort of split into a couple of different places and some of it ended up with Westpac. Yep. The investment management part of it ended up in, in, in the Westpac group and, and a lot of the M&A advisory business ended up with what we now know of as Macquarie. Uh, so it was just a wonderful experience working there, um, but one which I think left me feeling working on transactions the whole time is interesting and and and, and fun and, uh, uh, and and you certainly learn a lot. But I really hankered for being on the other side of the table. I think as you as you worked with senior executives who, yes, were working on deals, but also had the responsibility of of managing these these big and interesting and complex businesses, I thought. Once I think, they've been bought, that's right. I thought I'm I'm, I'm I'd, I'd love to actually get more involved in in managing. Is that businesses. something you actually went through? Your mind? Do you actually did oh, you, do you remember thinking that? Like I absolutely remember thinking it. And then the very clear next step for me was to say, well, what am I going to do to sort of break the nexus here? How how am I going to move from one environment to the other? And I took myself off overseas and did an MBA in France at a business school called INSEAD, which was a you know. Definitely one of the best years of my life, I think, and and has given me an amazing uh, global network of of really uh, uh, talented people who who I got to know during during that time. How did you know to do that there? I don't think I did really. All I knew was if I'm going to take some time out from my career now and and do some further study, I actually want to do it at one of the the best places you can do it in the world, not just in Australia. Australia's got some terrific uh, business schools, no doubt about it. But at that time, it was the US schools or it was one of two schools in Europe, of which one was INSEAD and, and that's the one that I, uh, that I ended up choosing. And it was a, you know, a, an amazing experience and, and, and one which then led me to the opportunity you were mentioning before, which was to join General Electric uh, and working for them out of London uh, initially – again, on transactions. So I hadn't quite reinvented myself at that point. I think I was armed with a lot more skills and and, a, and an even stronger desire to head towards more general management and leading and running businesses. Uh, but I wasn't quite there yet, I think, and, and fell back a little bit on what I what I knew and still loved, which is working on deals and, and had the experience of being you know, a relatively young Australian bloke based in London working on deals for GE in Europe, buying businesses all around Europe well, for what, GE. What, what period was that? Like we are talking about early what? Early late time? 90s. Late 90s, like R- around about close enough to 2000 though? Uh, in, yes. yes. So close enough in, in, the, in, the, in the sort of lead up to 2000 because I can remember, the, the you know, the Y2K yep. bug, uh, European uh, currency ca- coming in, the dot-com boom, got to see some of those things. Uh, um, you know, up up close, which was great. Whilst working for you know quite an incredible company at the time, GE, one of the world's largest companies. Well, you know the story. Well, too well, well, but I think we should talk about it because it it actually was the world's largest company by market capitalization. That's right. During that period, and I remember at one stage in one stat, it was if you added every company in Australia's market capitalization that was listed on the ASX, GE's market capitalization was bigger than all of them put together. Right. And yeah. um, that, that was pretty incredible. And it probably was one of the most acquisitive companies in the world. It bought more businesses. Inquisitive. Than, correct. Which is why I think I, I, I chose GE, if you like, as a place to Did go Did you and know work. that? Yeah, yes, absolutely. Because they, they had – the team that I joined with in GE based in London was a, was a team of probably 40-odd people who, whose sole job was to assist GE in buying businesses just in Europe. That was just the, the European team. Uh, and so I thought, well, this is going to be a really interesting place for me to go to sort of bridge this world of uh, having having M and A capability and knowledge and, and working on deals, but doing so as a principal, working for the company making the acquisitions rather than being an advisor. And and I think that ended up being a good decision because what it meant was. GE were very supportive of people that wanted to move from working in a in a sort of transaction team, that in-house M and A team, out into the world of 
uh, GE businesses or acquired businesses. So in my case, it was, uh, and this is where you'll see the connection through to, to Wizard, uh, GE made one of its first big mortgage company acquisitions globally in the UK, and I was involved in sourcing that, that deal, working on the transaction, all of the due diligence, and I kind of loved that company so much that I thought, well, I'd love to be part of their leadership team going forward. And so, so could I, you just explain that how that works so Andrew? Like so like there was a team that did the acquisition and then that team, once the acquisition was completed, it would drop off and then a, a, an operations team would move. That, that's exactly right. Any acquisition that was made by GE was not made in isolation. There needed to be a GE business that was effectively supporting the acquisition and that would then be responsible for it once it had been acquired. And GE then had a very formulaic, you might say, approach to saying, okay, once we've bought these businesses, how do we integrate them into the, into the GE fold? And so I had my first experience, I suppose, of being on the other side of the fence from, from the, the acquisition where I followed the acquisition and became the leader of the integration of that business into, into GE. Or, or as someone once said to me, you made a big mistake there, Andrew, because you worked on the deal and you worked on the integration. So if anything went wrong, you, can't you had yourself. nowhere to hide. <laughs> yeah, you, can, you can't blame <laughs> but, yourself. But it, it ended up, I think, being a, a you know, tremendously successful acquisition and, and in a way launched for GE this stronger appetite for uh, – home lending, mortgage-type businesses as, as businesses that could be very interesting as part of GE's uh, larger consumer finance uh, business. And, and, and I don't think most people know, but GE, GE Capital was probably one of the biggest consumer, if not the biggest consumer finance company in the world. That's right. Lend more money to consumers, finance money, or finance more consumers through mortgages or whatever the case may be than probably anybody else in the world. Yeah, Which ultimately became, became a problem for them when it, the it GFC did, hit. It, it did become a problem and the GFC was definitely an inflection point. But there was, in the lead up to that, uh, yeah, financial services and GE Capital, the, the, the that sort of finance arm, if you like, of GE, was around about half the total profitability of the business. It was it had almost become too big. And, yeah. and in becoming too big, it, it, it actually became one of the things which was a little bit of the, the undoing of, of GE as it sort of entered – a new era post GFC. Yeah, the GFC certainly did have a because the bigger you were, the harder you're going to fall in that respect. So you can't say, you know, that old saying, you know, too big to fail. It didn't happen in relation to G's that particular the, the capital part of the business. When you were working at G, could you tell me what what sort of experiences and what did you learn about business, generally speaking, not not necessarily financial services, but just generally, what did you learn from that organisation? I mean, I had a number of learnings myself, but what did you learn from it? Like, for example, you did the Six Sigma course. Right. So I think, I think and Six Sigma was just one example of a big global initiative that from time to time GE would really back in. They would say- And who was the individual who built this up, whose idea this was? Oh, uh, well, uh, I think the Six Sigma idea went back to Jack Welsh. Yeah. You know, so, and, and I was in, at GE during the Jack Welsh era. In fact, that deal I was talking about before in the UK, I remember going to Fairfield GE's headquarters in the US and pitching that deal to, to Jack Welsh right on the cusp of him moving on and the, and the new CEO, Jeff Immelt, coming in. And they were both in the room at the time. It's like one of those experiences yeah, where yeah. you say, <laughs> you knew you were at the sort of yeah, beating man, heart and, of the business. And, and, that, and like a lot of people don't know who that is, but they're, they're legends, yeah. global legends, both of them, yeah. for, and for different reasons. But yeah, so, so Six Sigma was, I, I would just say, one of a number of initiatives that GE would roll out almost with military pre precision across all its businesses, all its geographies. And in this case, it was really a methodology in very simple terms about how do you use data to make better business decisions? I'm, I'm really simplifying no, no, that. that, but, I that know, but that's very important though, Andrew. It's sort of what it boiled down to. It was rather than sort of thinking, yeah, I, I know what the right thing to do is, let's do that. It was, hold on, let's slow down. Let's gather a little bit more information, make sure we really understand the problem and see whether that actually leads us to a, to a better alternative solution, better solution. And so there was... There was a whole lot of science that went along with that, and if you if you really were to your language earlier, you know, master black belt of uh, you know, G Six Sigma, that that meant that you'd you'd invested the time both in whether it was study, but also practical projects in businesses to sort of learn the art of 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 how you did what I was saying before. How do you use data in a very structured way to make better business decisions? We think about that now, and we say, no shit. 
You know, it happens you, all you time can make, yeah, yeah. In fact, it's moved way beyond the, even the narrowness of Six Sigma, but it was they, they were probably the early days of a, of a business starting to think very differently about the way that you 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 could grow or tackle problems or challenges and do it in a really structured way. So as I, as I understand it, I'm, I've never done the course, but as I understand it, it's a mathematical um, probability um, methodology or technology using data to apply to any number of things, but in the case of G, they might apply to um, the outcome that they expect to get from aeroplane engines, which G used to make. I don't know if they still make them, but used to make aeroplane engines. They probably made 40% of all aeroplane engines in the world at the time and financed them. Um, and uh, they would want to say, look, the we need to have enough discipline around how this engine works such that we're only going to have one in a million fa- failures. That, that's right. So the, the can six, only fail once every million times. That's right. And the and the six sigma sigma was standing, you know, statistically st- standard deviation. Yeah. You know, you're right out in a very low probability so part of I'll the curve. So I'll draw it. We got a we got a y axis here and x axis here. We have got a bell curve. Yeah. And the the mean is in the middle. And the deviations go either side of the mean. And so what we're talking about is six standard deviations from, from the, mean. the mean. So That's right. in other words, because the bell curve goes like that, those events are down at the bottom of the bell curve. So they're Very un- low probability. unlikely events. That's right. And what what a Six Sigma black belt was always trying to do is make sure that you de-risked the event that, that's right. And, of occurring. That's right. And it was very process driven. So if you've got a process that's manufacturing a part that's going in an aircraft engine and there's the potential for that process to generate a defect, you, you want that process to be so good that the probability of a defect is very low. That's yes. sort of three and a half in, in a million. Interestingly, the aircraft engines as a business, they used to operate at seven sigma. Because, seven, seven, yeah. and, and I think the reason why is when we get on a plane, we don't want it to drop out of the sky. I don't even want to be one in a million. I'm going to be <laughs> no, something that's else. That's right. But, but they also <laughs> used to apply it to the call centre in India, as I recall, because I, I was there. They, like they don't want a, a, a person who calls into the call centre from Australia, wherever it is, and then something go wrong with that call. So they had the same – they used the same technology it was and the, And it was the same principles. So I think that's where sometimes some people went a little bit wrong with it in terms of trying to apply the absolute precision of it to processes which were going to be a bit different. You imagine a call centre and the probability yep. of a call not – going well, particularly when it involves a lot of human beings. Yep. It's a little bit higher, but it was more that you're applying the principle of Six Sigma to that process and trying to understand, well, what's causing the defects? Let's address those and reduce the probability, you know, of something going wrong. That well, was that's kind of the methodology. I often talk, Andrew, about, you know, I have this view on a play, on playbooks. I mean, how a playbook works to run a business. I mean, and, and G was big on playbooks, generally speaking. And the G was big on a thing called rhythm as well. Operating rhythm. Operating that's rhythm. Right. <laughs> but but one of the things that in my playbook, for example, I talk about is play defensively in chapter two. And and what I'm talking about is um systems and processes and um all those defensive mechanisms in a business that stops the business from getting a bad reputation, you know, airplane falls out of the sky or, you know, something goes wrong or you just don't answer a call, you don't return a call because someone's running to buy, get a mortgage, you don't, there's an inquiry on there and you don't get, get back to them, those sorts of mistakes and errors in the system and process. And G, G to me was a company that inspired me to think about those those things when I would ordinarily never have thought about them. And, you know, whatever the mathematics are, it doesn't really matter. But do you think that that has had a big impact on Andrew Moore's progression through General Electric, then into uh, West St George and Westpac, and then on to Spaceship We Are Now? I mean, have you taken those great credentials and applied them in those various places? And do you think they've helped you get into those various places? Oh, definitely. In terms of applying them, I uh, absolutely. Even if it's not in exactly. The, the way that it might have I might have experienced it at GE I think a little bit like the way you're describing it you you learn to look at problems in a different way and you've then got this broader set of skills that you can use to apply and that so whether that was about something like six Sigma or the the operating rhythm of a business so that I, as I like to say you don't leave the success of the business up to chance <laughs> you're actually putting in place things which increase the probability that you're going to see if something's going wrong spot that make an intervention 
I think a whole lot of things that GE did about um, identifying talent and bringing forward talent, making sure you always had a really good team. You could almost work across a whole spectrum of different things and and reflect on different lessons that um, that I would have learned. And certainly, I think I found that they were easier to put into practice in another large corporate environment. Uh, so as you mentioned, I, uh, after 10 years at GE, I was with St George slash Westpac for close to another 10 years. Certainly, there was a, a lot that I was able to to to, to bring in terms of experience uh, into into that environment. The spaceship environment, I think it's it. Yeah, it, but it's, it's, it's different. It's, it's more quirky, but it, it doesn't matter. It's still it probably I, I think more it's quirky. Still, more it's still all there, but but there's there's then a whole lot of other things that you have to learn and bring to the table in in that environment. Not necessarily yourself, but through other people, so that you you can you can deal with the challenges of building a scaling business as opposed to a sort of slightly more mature business perhaps. One of the other things I observed in General Electric, which is I, I really didn't fit into very well, but um, – but <laughs> I, we, I don't recall that well, at all. Most people as, don't as realise. My, I, I, as I, the I, illustrious <laughs> chairman of Wizard Home Loans while, while I was well, there, we, I, I, we remember, were a sort of dynamic duo that was quite different. <laughs> we were, but it, I actually really enjoyed myself. And and, and one of the things I, I, I don't know if you recall, but I entered into a joint venture with General Electric in India uh, with myself and James Packer, and I we had forty percent, they had sixty percent, and um, and I was dealing with what was Dave's second name? Dave, the chairman of uh, the, um, the CEO of um, G Capital, um, Dave Nissen. Dave Nissen. So Dave and I are on a board along with um, uh, Tom Gentilly and James Packer, and uh, and I was the chairman of this board, and uh, it was a global board we had, and uh, and uh, I remember once they invited me to, uh, I think it was Stanford. Um, it was Connecticut anyway, um, somewhere in Connecticut, might have been Fairfield, I can't remember. But there was a, but they held these uh, meetings like every year and you had to go on pitch and and all the heads of all the business all around the world came around and flew in this place and you had 15 minutes to pitch. And I remember sitting in this auditorium and uh, uh, everyone all had PowerPoints and I had no fucking PowerPoint <laughs> and uh, and it was my turn to pitch and Dave said, well, this is Mark Boris, the chairman of Wizard Home in Australia, we've just acquired it. You know, could you, and I just got them talked for 15 <laughs> minutes. Anyway, after it, everybody congratulated me. Everyone said, it was so good not to have to look at a PowerPoint for once in your life. But the thing I learned is that that happened all the time. So they did these quite regularly and it started off, say, here in Sydney. So, you know, you were the CEO. You would prepare your part in relation to Wizard and it'd move its way up to, the, to, you know, to someone like me and I'd have to go and present sort of what you might have – prepared i didn't in this case but that's how it worked the thing that i thought was brilliant was they continually reassessed their businesses it might have been quarterly i can't remember now but it was it was a continual process it was a rhythm and i think that was very very important learning for me and they they assessed everything they just didn't go and they did it quickly because they had a massive business massive businesses um, how important is that process to you? Hugely important, and 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 I think that that rhythm that you talk about—that's what 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 I what I was saying before. But by doing that, you're just not leaving it to chance. You think of GE, a huge global conglomerate. How how are you going to manage all of the complexity associated with that business? And and one of the ways they did it by, was by saying, well, let's have some very standard processes that we apply to every single business. Uh, regardless of which geography, regardless of what industry that you're in, it's a, it's a sort of standardised way about thinking about the success of that business. And there would be certain calendar events. So one of those things might be about a one-year budgeting uh, exercise. There might be another bit about, well, what's the, what's the people part of your business? How's that looking? The talent, the progression. Another bit might be about the longer-term strategic plan. But every business will have gone through the same process. As you say, fairly... Fairly quickly, yeah. and you needed to be well prepared for it, because certainly if you weren't well prepared, that that got identified, yeah, totally. incredibly quickly. Yeah, you, you, it was sort of like a, it was like your performance review, a, a little bit, if you yeah. didn't, if you didn't get it right. Well, I I, I want to jump straight from G into Spaceship. I, I know you had a period of time at Westpac, and it was, I mean, I, I remember it well, St George Westpac. Um, but I, I I just think we just leave that behind. Um, let's just go straight into Spaceship. Um, First, first and foremost, uh, tell me how you got. Did you get recruited, or how, how that? How did you end up there? You start off as chairman, as I recall. Well, that's right. It, it was, in fact, after I left Westpac, I I had a bit of a period. Uh, I had a wonderful year in uh, twenty seventeen, just to say, what do I want to do next? 
and um, I was about to turn 50 and and thought, I, I need to do something different. I, I could very easily have kind of fallen into another similar sort of job with a similar sort of company, perhaps with a different coloured brand. And, and, and I was thinking, I just don't think I want to do that. I, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on in this emerging fintech industry. This looks like it could be a bit of an opportunity for me to reinvent myself. And I, I spent a lot of time meeting uh, startup businesses, scaling businesses, the people that were funding those businesses at the in venture capital and the smaller end of private equity. I used to come away from those meetings incredibly invigorated by the people that I met. And I thought, this is what I've got to do next, not go into another big startup corporate board. job. I need to do something which is kind of closer to... Yeah, I start pure startup. I think I looked at and thought, I'm not sure that's going to be exactly the right fit for me, but something which is a little bit further along and and is starting to scale and could benefit from some of the skills that we were talking about before that I've got, maybe that would be a good fit. And uh, and the first opportunity that I, I got to turn that into a reality was with um, Spaceship, which had then been in existence for about a year. It had launched its first product a year before I became chairman of the company. And I was introduced to the company by some of the uh, uh, larger investors in the company at the time, one of, uh, one of whom was Airtree Ventures. Uh, and, and, and I had some connection with some of the guys at Airtree, Craig Blair and, and Daniel Petrie. And they, you know, their sense was, look, Andrew, I think this could be a really interesting opportunity for you to help us out with with uh, where Spaceship's at and where we would like it to go, and 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 a lot of your financial services experience would be incredibly helpful to us there, and and that was a good fit for me too, and so I I, I jumped in. Now, I would like to say eyes wide open. <laughs> it's, no, you, you, it's it's amazing what you discover, you know, after whether it's a day, a week, a month, in, in terms of well, what what is it exactly that I've got myself involved with here? But I I definitely knew I was alive, which was which was great because it it's uh, it's sort of exhilarating to be involved with a company that. You know, is, is perhaps working through some challenges, trying to identify where its next next bit of growth is going to come from, building a brand, operating in a highly regulated industry. There's everything's just coming at you at a million miles an hour, and uh, but you don't have all of those things that you're used to having in terms of support networks to deal with that. You're not sitting in a big company. Which has a massive balance sheet. Massive balance sheet. It has you know big teams of people that can do all sorts of different things. You often find yourself, you know, doing what feels like close to everything for a period of time until you start to construct the team around you a little bit and work out where you where you want to go. Now, initially, I was in the chairman role, so that was uh, you know more clearly more non-executive. But but if I was really honest, it felt a little bit halfway in between. And I worked very closely with uh, one, one of the founders of the business who was still there for a period of uh, 18 months um, before we sort of ended up parting ways. And 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 that created uh, an opportunity for me to step in as, as a chairman sometimes has to, to be an interim CEO. <laughs> I would say to anyone that's ever given that opportunity, be very careful of that word <laughs> interim. It can sort of get scratched off before you know what's happened. You just which is, the word CEO. Which is what, what happened with me actually. And uh, it hadn't necessarily been part of the plan. Um, and, and what I found happened is as I, as I got into that role and did have the opportunity to be, that's another thing I would say to anyone who's got the opportunity to be interim CEO, scratch off the word interim yourself because don't think for a second that you're anything other than the CEO. Yeah, when no you're interim. Interim. You're there CEO. is no such thing. You've yeah. actually got to immediately take the reins and, and, and direct traffic and move the business forward. And, and I think in doing that for a period of a couple of months as, we were, uh, as I was also looking to, uh, on behalf of the board, recruit the new CEO, the major shareholders of the company said, well, actually, Andrew, the person we would really like to uh, be the CEO of Spaceship is, is you. And <laughs> I remember thinking, hang on, that wasn't part of the deal. I, uh, but happily for them and well, happily I did, for you. Well, I, I did have to think quite a bit about it. I, I recall the conversation I had with you, Mark, mm. as I was uh, contemplating embarking on that and, and, and you provided some terrific advice because you really do want to go into it with your eyes open. When you're leading a business like that, even though I would say I, on paper, 
you've been in roles that look and feel a lot bigger than that in terms of the profitability or the scale of the business, the number of people, a whole lot of things that people will sometimes use to say this is what, you know, this is what makes a job big or important or hard. This job may have looked a lot smaller. It has been much more challenging and the responsibility of it has just been so much more all encompassing because you are the you know you are the company uh, you this is what you said would happen to me yeah. i didn't actually know what you were talking about i thought yeah i had a good catch up with mark and you know, not not sure what all that was about but literally what you said was very true you know you immediately you know the 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 the, the weight of it the challenge along with all of the excitement it's all there in in spades um, and your age is you uh, uh, one year per day. We just got to go to the break. We're going to come straight back because this is what I want to talk about. I want to talk about your experiences and how, and what, how you felt about your decision and where and what have you guys been doing and where you're up to today. So we go to the break. We come straight back. Okay. We're back from the break, and I, and I'm talking to Andrew Moore. And Andrew is. Now his current role as CEO of Spaceship, and uh, I'm really desperate to talk to you about is the the concept of um, empowering young people, getting young people interested, or young the younger generation interested in investing for their future. Sort of one of the things Spaceship does. Um, where's that idea come from? Like, and who, and, uh, and how do you actually execute on that? Yeah, so that that is you've actually described kind of why we exist in a way. What is Spaceship all about? It's all about enabling younger generations to invest in their future. And can you define the generation? We, we, it, now we would actually say millennials and and uh, Gen Zs. So so broadly from uh, late teens through to through to say forty, that would be our kind of core target market. I think we actually started out with it being more millennials. So at the older end of that market, I think what we found is the brand has really resonated incredibly well with the uh, the Gen Zs who are coming through. Uh, c- coming through and, and having very similar experiences to millennials. But to your question about what is it that we're trying to do, we, w- we want to put young people in the driver's seat when it comes to investing. Not We, we don't want to say um, we, we're going to make all of the decisions for you or we're, 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 going to do, we're going to tell you what to do. We actually – that's why we use the word enabling. We want to almost – you know provide people the tools, the content, the education, the information that allows them to make good decisions about how they invest. And and I think the the, the thing that we worked out along the way, because when Spaceship first launched, we were we actually launched a superannuation product because we said, wow, young people are really so disengaged with super. And uh, we need to do something about that. It's going to be their biggest financial asset. They need to be more involved. They need they need to understand what they're doing. They need to make good choices. And we boldly launched into that space uh, in January 2017. I think what we found is when the only thing you've got to talk to someone about is superannuation, you're up against it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and almost like that very problem we were trying to solve was the very problem we had as a business trying to grow. So we said, well, well you're sort of creating the problem. We, we in, or in, part in, of it. That's right. So in a way we said, well, what if we what if we had a different product? that we could use to engage uh, younger people with and and we launched this micro investing product technically it's a managed fund product we don't use that language with customers it's a it, it's a product which someone with um, very low balance uh, is able to uh, low balance you know, where in, so, sorry in terms of their investment balance right. they, they, they can start they can open their account with a dollar okay they, they don't need a minimum level of investment. It's very low cost. And it doesn't have to be their super. It's, it can be anything. It, that's right. It, 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 and they can get started uh, very very quickly and easily. And, in fact, ease, uh, when, when it comes to thinking what is one of those things that makes us different, ease and ease of use, that is what our customers say to us all the time. It was so easy to get started, Spaceship. It's so easy to see my balance. It's so easy to understand what underlying stocks I'm invested in. And and I think what we found as a result of that and, and launching that product, in in three and a half years, that brought us what we've now got 220,000 customers that have a 
an investment account with Spaceship, which has a balance in it. So that's not including anyone that's been and gone or anyone that started and never put any money into it. That's people who've got an active account with us. That that's enabled them to get started in this world of investing. And and I would say many of our customers, not necessarily at the uh, not necessarily experienced investors. Very, very mass market, people that may not have invested before. So very frequently, where did the money come from to start their spaceship account? A bank account where they're earning less than half a percent or whatever it is. And they want to be involved in this thing called the share market or in equity investing. They just don't know how to do it. So sell me. So I'm 25, I wish, but I'm 25. I've got five grand. You know, um, and I, I've decided I want to invest it. How do I find out about you? I mean, where would you normally find me? Where would you be? Where would you be pitching to me? You you would sort of come across us in um, sort of social media, yep. perhaps. Uh, you know, Facebook, Instagram, uh, or, or Google. You would sort of discover Spaceship. Uh, would you Would you profile me? We we do yep. we do absolutely. So we we we're, we're kind of. I, you know, identifying and in the, and in this current world of financial services, you have to understand who your target yep. market is. So you would be in the in the target market. You would you would hear a little bit about spaceship and 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 really we would be saying something to you like investing made easy, right? And you would be thinking investing. Well, that's what I want to do. I've got five thousand dollars in the bank. I've I've just had a look at how much I've made in interest in the last year. It's been absolutely nothing. Everyone around me is talking about. Um, you know, putting that money perhaps into the stock market or buying some shares. Is that right? Are the twenty-five-year-olds or less are talking about that? Absolutely, absolutely, and and certain things at various periods of time will accelerate the conversations that are happening about that. In February of this year, when there was a lot of talk about a company called GameStop in the yep. US, we we saw this massive uplift in our business, which was really just because more people were talking about investing than ever before. Wow! And so you're out there with your five thousand dollars, saying, "I want to do something with this." You're likely to hear about us, I would say, either because of your own online activity and the way that we would be trying to identify customers like you or referral. We get in any given day or week, a third to a half of our business will come from internal customer referral. Someone will actually say, oh, Mark, Mark, you, 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 need, to, you need to look at Spaceship. In fact, I can, re- I can refer you. And it'll be five dollars for you and five dollars for me if you open up a spaceship account with so five referral fee. In. Yeah, that's right. But very low, very yeah. low fee. We experimented with higher fees in the past, and then it becomes a bit of a game for people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we yeah. don't want that. We just want to. We just want someone to be encouraged to be able to make a referral, and uh, you wouldn't have to do anything complicated to get started. You wouldn't have to call a broker or understand what an ETF was or. Uh, have a minimum balance of ten thousand dollars. You would go to go to the app store and download an app, and it would literally step you through the process of investing your five thousand dollars. And in many ways, the only decision you would need to make is, okay, which one of these three portfolios do I want to invest in? Do I want to invest in this one, which is sort of a bit more tilted to growth and technology stocks? Do I want to invest in one which is a bit more large company? index type investing or do I want to invest in the one which is ESG sustainable? Um, they're, the, they're the only three options. Each of them diversified portfolios. You don't you don't then have to choose which shares you're going to buy within those portfolios because you're saying, well, I don't know how to do that. I wouldn't know which companies I, to buy. I, I wouldn't either, by the way. I mean, it's, it's not no. my belly with either, but even though everyone thinks I could, I can't. Yeah. So, so if you you make your choice about which, uh, and and by the way, you could invest all of your five thousand dollars in one portfolio, or you could break it up and invest it across the three portfolios, and uh, and then what we would uh, 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 when you'd immediately kind of come through to the sort of dashboard in the app, and you'd be able to track. So you your give me a dashboard. Experience. Yes, yes. And what, um, and what does it allow me? What's the dashboard allow me to do? It would uh, essentially it allows you to see how your balance is growing over time. It, it allows you to see how the underlying portfolio is performing because remember your balance can grow over time by you putting more money into your account, but mm. also by the return on the money you've already got there. There's two components to it. So we like to be able to break that up for people so that you can actually see well what's my balance and how's it growing, but also how's that portfolio of shares performing. 
so that is very visible for you. And at the companies you are actually invested in, we're very transparent about that as well. You can see exactly which companies you're invested in, how much they make up of the portfolio and percentage terms. And we give you a bit of information about those companies. You know, why do we like this company? What are the risks associated with this company? And, and provide some links through to like video type information about the company. It might be, it might be something like this. Uh, if Spaceship was a listed company, yep. it might be a link to a, a mentor, video, a conversation to help you understand a little bit more, more about it. And by doing that, I think we're just creating connection for people with this idea of what they're invested in. Now, now that dashboard also has a regular news feed, so we're curating and writing our own content to help to educate people really about the world of investing, about the companies that they're invested in, and trying to create a little bit of interest around that. So it's a, uh, it's very much about it's making it simple to be involved and to and to feel part of it. And and our our the the money that is invested in those uh, not in superannuation but in these other products is invested by our in house investment team. We have a small in house investment team of of three people who are very connected with the types of businesses that we tend to invest in. And they are businesses that meet our criteria for what we call where the world is going. <laughs> and what does that mean then? Like, I mean, are we talking about like investing in Westpac shares? I mean, what are we talking about? No, no. So w- when we think about where the world is going, we're looking for themes that kind of reflect where the world is going. So that might be themes around sustainability. It might be around, um, you know, electric vehicles. It may be around uh, technology stocks and growth stocks. So you will tend to see the majority of the money getting invested with Spaceship has a bit more of a tilt to, to, to businesses that are at the sort of growth and technology end of the spectrum. And, and a lot of that money is also by weight. We're probably about 20% invested in Australian companies uh, and 80% invested in international companies. Because if you're going to invest where the world is going, last time I checked, Australia isn't, mm. isn't the world. And a lot, a lot of the interesting things that are happening in the world in terms of technology, certainly some of those things are happening in Australia, but there, there's a lot of really interesting businesses to invest in internationally. So it, it, it's, it's very interesting. So do you, I mean, you said you did psychology at university and uh, all of a sudden you're sort of talking in psych or behavioural terms, um, the beha- behaviour of your cohort of investors being someone from 40 to say 18 for argument's sake, um, their, their, the behaviour of those investors, investors, in other words, what they think about, what they, what, what's important to them, social conscience, technology, etc. Um, you know where the world is going. Language. I, I, you, I you're think using that's language. I think where the world is going can mean different things to different people, yeah. but it it certainly is is intended to be. It's intended to, to, to create connection. That's the behavioural piece that you might say. It's really, you know, that people can feel, I love this idea that yeah. I'm with a company that's thinking about what's happening in the world and is then supporting that with the with the way that they're investing. And it's not all about ESG, as I say. I think a lot of people equate that with, oh, okay, so you're about ethical investing. And I would say that's really important to us. But so are, so is technology and developments in technology, and and so is being able allowing people to access investing internationally, which is can be expensive depending on the way that you want to do that. So, which is the other thing that I should say, you're you're with your five thousand dollars, you're able to invest that with us and get access to all of that information, and that will cost you two dollars fifty a month. Right. So there's a, there's a small sort of ongoing cost. Yes. Now, thirty bucks a month. I, I 30, should, 30 bucks a I, year I should or say it may depend a little bit on the amount of money that you've got invested with us. But what we want to do is to encourage people to say, even if you've got a smaller amount of money, where thirty dollars a year might sound like a, a lot relative to that, is we want to create uh, the encouragement to 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 build up that investment balance. The more you put into it, you don't pay any more. Yeah. <laughs> it, you the, and and one of the things we really encourage our, our customers to do is not just put a blob of money in. So your example, your five thousand dollars, we would also create the opportunity for you to say, you ought to set up an investment plan. That's what we call it, investment plan, weekly, fortnightly, or monthly. Make a commitment about amount an, uh, an amount of money you're going to put in. Is that and like an automatic debit from my account? That's right. We have over a hundred thousand customers that have set that up, and I I would call those plans quite modest in some ways. The 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 median weekly plan twenty five bucks a week. The That's median cool. monthly plan fifty bucks a month. Wow. Not 
not That's break good. the bank amounts of money. But it's, it's sensible, smart, and it's good. It's consistent. And, and, it, and it is encouraging good habits and behaviours because what we want, go back to what, what we're wanting to do, we want people to start early. Time is on your side as an investor if you mm. start early. We want people to realise that uh, regularly contributing to an investment account is a great way to build that balance too. And then time works for you in two ways. Time uh, both of, of, you know, $50 a month, uh, you know, over the course of a over the course of the year, it, it, that's, and forty that's a, years. Th- that's right, and the return that you're making on it, and, and I think that then leads us to something which is really important. By experiencing us in that way, we're then able to start having a conversation, you like, with our customers about another really important investment account that they have, and if they have a job, they have one of these accounts. Mm. It's a thing called superannuation. Mm. You know. The thing that causes a whole lot of people to glaze over. Oh, do you really, do I need to worry about super? Isn't that thing that I can't touch till I'm 65? Same principles apply. Super is just an investment account. It just happens to be a special one. Mm. <laughs> one that you can't touch till you're older, sure, so it's intended to be there for retirement. It has certain tax advantages about it, which are fantastic. But really, everyone ought to be just thinking about it. Well, this is another investment that I've got. Do I really understand it? Am I... Do I understand it the way I understand my spaceship investment account? I've got $5,000 here in spaceship in this account and I know what I'm invested in, how it's performing, I'm connected with it, I love the companies it's invested in. Who's my super with? Where, where, where is it? Should I, should I perhaps be thinking about my super in the same way? That's what we're wanting to encourage. And I think the way we think about what we're doing is starting a relationship perhaps with a simpler product that's easier for someone to commit to and get started with uh, and then encourage those good behaviours and, and, and then extend that relationship through to, to a, a, what will hopefully be, with many of our customers, a great long-term relationship with superannuation. Well, I mean, what's, what, what, do you do any sort of surveys on them and what are they saying? Well, th- th- we do and they tell us a little bit about uh, – Hey, wouldn't it, a spaceship? It would be great if <laughs> spaceship. It would be great if you had a product which could that's so could help me save for a home loan. Is one thing that we yep. hear. Maybe a product which is a bit different to an equity portfolio. So perhaps a little bit lower risk, lower return, but that someone could feel comfortable with relative to having that money. Like a sophisticated a, savings account. That, that, that's but, right. But, but not, not only 0.1 of a percent. That, that, that's right. So yep. we so we we hear that a lot from customers. Yep. Perhaps not surprisingly, we hear from some customers. About crypto, yeah. Who would say I'm? If you did crypto, spaceship, then I would maybe I would feel a little bit better about that because mm. I'm I'm not sure. I don't know whether that's the right thing for me to be involved with or not. And uh, so I think they're they're the types of things that we hear about. But but equally, we hear a lot about what they want, not just with investing product, but with content. I'd I'd like to learn more about superannuation or Here's another wonderful thing. I'd like to learn more about the first home super saver scheme. Yeah. There's this wonderful thing we have in Australia where young people, the best place for them to be saving money for a, for a home deposit is inside superannuation. Hmm. Is that being pointed out to them no. by a lot of the incumbents in this industry? No. no. No, no. I, I, right. I told myself I was going to re- resist the temptation to say anything about uh, about anyone else in the in the industry, but that's the type of thing that we want to do. Do I would I love the idea that we saw money go into a superannuation account, build up to thirty thousand dollars, or soon to be fifty thousand dollars when the uh, when some legislation changes, and then that money goes out the door from Spaceship towards a, a home loan deposit for one of our customers. Can't think of anything better. Yeah. I, it's not about keeping as much money as we can in the spaceship account and never wanting anyone to leave. It's about are we solving problems? Are we helping people as they move through different stages of their life? That's, that's what, the thing. That's what inspires me. That's, that's why I'm involved. Me. That's why. That's why I fell in love with the company along the way because you thought we can we can do this differently to the way. Yeah, you're not running an investment vehicle. I love that. You're you're running. Um, Something that enables people, something that changes behaviors for the for the for the future, something that helps people achieve other outcomes other than you just running an investment vehicle. We don't make more money when people put more money into their investment account with Spaceship because we we just charge a flat fee. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, uh, so you're not incentivized. No, no, that, 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 that's that right. Or, or another thing, if we were if we really were an uh, an investment vehicle or an investment management company, I would have been talking to you about what's our performance been like. 
because that's the way everyone tends yep. to think about, yep. well, what's success? Whereas I think for us, success is about really starting to connect with with people who we think we can make a real difference in their life and we can set them up for for success you know and that's not we talk about investing for their for their future it's not just investing for their financial future it's also just investing in their their knowledge investing in their their, their confidence in the way that they move through the world we we get some wonderful stuff back from customers who tell us about you know just how much of a difference spaceship has made for them because it's 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 caused them to do things that they just hadn't previously been able to do that reg- regularly putting money aside being involved in investing when previously they felt they'd been excluded from that learning a whole lot of things uh, about investing and companies because we use a language to talk about that that doesn't they don't feel excluded can we just talk about the language yeah you, you said you 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 come up with a few phrases I mean, you, and you do come from the G environment where they had their own language. G had its own language. It took me ages to work out so what G was talking about. A lot of the executives of G were talking about a lot of times because they spoke in a language, a G language. Six Sigma is a good example. Do you have a language that you use and have you done this purposefully to make people feel comfortable and get rid of ric- get rid of friction? Uh, I would say absolutely. And the lang- the language, we've even got a name for it. We call it plain English. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it, it, it's amazing how little bits of terminology yeah. can immediately cause someone to switch off. Superannuation, yeah. scary. Right, right off the bat, that's the su- a word. And, th- and then you go the next level below and people want to talk about involuntary contributions, voluntary uh, contrib- contributions. Uh, it, it turns it, me off. Even me, like I, I think, I mean, like I'm an age where I can retire. I still don't want to hear about it. Like I'm not interested. That, that, that's right. So I think it, it's it, tax free. I like. Yeah. Well, I think people get that. <laughs> yeah. And that's a, so if you start to say, look, this, this, this could be, uh, you know, a, a way of ensuring that you're not paying more. T- so even now, as I'm thinking, how would we say this? Not paying more tax than you need to. Mm. That's. You know, you don't talk about tax effect, tax effective. You know, we yeah. we might say yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, Even yeah. that is like tax effective. What does that mean? Yeah. I, I if I think about it, yeah. I, I, I want to. But, know but what if it you means. say not paying more tax than you need to, oh, I, I actually get that. So, it, do you hold huddles at Spaceship to work on language and then put the I, language onto your website? I, I think we're we're very oh, fortunate app. to have some um, uh, terrific people, and, and over the course of time that we've been at Spaceship, we we've had people that sort of are fronting the brand in some ways. Um, uh, I should acknowledge Brinner from Spaceship, who <laughs> writes a lot of our content at the moment, but uh, Kelly, who's also in the team. They are just very good at, under, at being able to collapse how what we want to say. Into, I mean, how, how is it they understand? They're younger or is it, they, is it they, just they, their they, cohort? They, they, they certainly are. So, um, And as you were kindly pointing out before, I am not in the target segment of, the, of Spaceship. <laughs> so the great thing about Spaceship as a company for me, because I think this does keep me young, is the vast majority of the team are, are a good 20 years younger than I am. And they are... They need to be kind of let loose on this to yeah. be able to have the freedom to say, "Well, this is the way that we would say it," and 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 I, I love that. I, I love even times when I might be editing a bit of a document that's going to go out, a bit of comms, and I, and I'll do something, and someone will say, "We're not saying that, Andrew. That's not that's not the. I, I know that sounds good to you, but that's not. It's what, boring. It, yeah, yeah. And and I, this is the sort of ongoing challenge you have in a business like this. That well, I, especially coming from G, where everything was over. Sanitized, like I remember once we tried to get the G at the. Um, I, I remember once we, when we were in India, we had the wizard business in India, and we wanted to put the G E lozenge. Is it what's it called lozenge or something? The G E thing with the G the round circle G in the middle on the bottom of the on, on the bottom of our documentation to show it was a G company. It was sixty percent owned by G. My God, it took like uh, seven months. We had to get India. Uh, CEO to approve it, this, this, the head of PR or whatever it is, public relations approved it, then it had to go to the, the regional area, then it had to go to America. And like uh, it was by the time we got there, like we'd already been in operation for six months, seven months. This is a different type of environment for you. And it's modern and it's what, how young people think. It, it, it is. And actually when I think about where's been the experience in my career that I've had to draw back on to try and understand what do you need to do to be a challenger brand, to actually attract attention, to be different? Guess what I think about? What do you think about? The wizard days. Wizard days, I know. Yeah. But, but, because we but had a proposition different to everybody in those days. Yeah, but but it, but it is it is still, we do need to always challenge ourselves yeah, with yeah. that. So even, uh, and we can play with it. Spaceship's a wonderful brand. Yeah, you, know, you can totally do, is. You can, you can play name. with it so much. So, so then if you ask, 
spaceship, you can talk about, you know, why you should give a flying F about your super because yeah. we're we're flying. <laughs> we're flying. Well, because because also you're you're given license to do it. I mean, you've created an environment where you've given yourself license to talk this, speak this way in this type of language with this type of content. I I, I and I, I really, I mean, I really do think. For me, um, I mean, I, Spaceship to me has all the elements of sort of businesses like back 10, 20 years ago did have. It's very rare you see these sorts of businesses today because everybody's compliant and regulated and conforming and part of the same deal. It's just great to see something like a business like Spaceship just, I, I, pardon the pun, but take off with such a big base of people, 220,000 people. Is that That's right. And I'm, I'm going to immediately jump in though and say, and we are – Compliant and, f- and totally, really, you know, the, the the trick is to, what we do with that is say all of that regulation that is there that can clamp you down. Our orientation on that is not okay. Here's a set of rules that we've got to follow. Our orientation is these are being introduced for largely for one reason to try and protect customers or do the right thing by customers. So we're going to embrace that and 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 make sure that we are doing everything that we need to do operating in a highly regulated industry, but we're, we're doing it not to check a box. We're yeah. doing it to try and connect with the reason that it's there in the first place, which is all about making sure customers are informed, making sure customers don't end up in products that they shouldn't end up in. All, all, all of the things where you're saying, well, if you're a decent company, wouldn't you be wanting to do that anyway? That's what we're doing. Well, when you connect with your customers, that a decent company who connects with the company, uh, their, their customers definitely would feel that way. But unfortunately, I, I think... A lot of us, and I'm hopefully it's not my case, but a lot of people in my age group or, or who have been around a long time, we tend to um, uh, just make this all part of a standard process and uh, as opposed to connecting with the individual, connecting with the customer, really understanding why is the customer there? What, in your case, people from 20 to 40, why, what, are that, what does that cohort of people want from me? And I've got, got to deliver it to them in yes. a way that's understandable and frictionless. Yeah, understandable, frictionless. And and also how do you introduce a bit of fun and something yeah. which is different? And you 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 were talking to me earlier saying, how do, how do you make this investing thing kind of fun and interesting? You know, we've introduced a new feature to our, our spaceship product recently called Boosts. And, it, and one of the things that you can do to boost your investment is you can set up what we call a recipe, which says if it rains in my postcode and you insert your postcode, Invest X dollars, and you put the number in, into my X portfolio. That's why we call it a recipe. So That's cool. Um, and, and, and then when that builds up to a level where it's kind of $10, a $10, you know, that investment will go, go into your account. But it's a way of actually saying, you know, we, we were sort of playing with this idea of, you know, people talk about investing for a rainy day. What about investing on a rainy day? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and it, it just... It makes it just a bit more interesting and but it's fun. also very clever. It, it, it causes, people appreciate that sort of stuff. Yeah, or, or and, and we're we're actually going to be asking our customers for what other recipes would you like? Yeah, you yeah. know, um, you know, you can imagine a recipe around every time I I run ten k's uh, as measured on my Strava app, uh, put. Put such and such into into my account. This is the wonderful world of technology. That yeah. that uh, raining in the postcode thing. We we don't have a whole bunch of people out in every postcode in Australia with a rain gauge checking whether it's raining. We just connect directly into the in, in, into the Bureau of Meteorology app. Get the data that we need. It's all completely automated. All yeah. fully digital. We don't have to do it. It's anything. very clever though. Yeah, and it's fun too. It is fun. It's fun. It's interesting. It it gives someone so when someone's then going to be talking about the brand and the business and what it means to be part of the spaceship community. You're going to say this is the sort of stuff that you get. It's- you know, it's really refreshing to me. Like, I mean, I, I've known you for a long time, but coming from the environments you come from, and like, you know, Westpac was a pretty strict uh, St George. Westpac was a pretty strict environment, and I know you did good things there. But like your your lease of life that you have talking to me about spaceship is nearly infectious. I think the reason you look 25, <laughs> notwithstanding you're double that, is there's something going on in your environment that is absolutely exhilarating for you. It's it's done good stuff for you, Andrew. Well, I get huge energy from the team that I work with. It's a r- absolutely wonderful team of people who are hugely connected with what it is that we're trying to do for customers. So I think there's that kind of the, there's the customers and the difference we want to make for them. And the team that is trying to bring that to life and coming up with great ideas for doing that, a huge source of energy, really, really big source of energy. And, and energies make businesses work. 
from yeah. my point of view. They, they definitely do. Well, we're going to run out. I've run out of time. So have you got anything you want to ask me? You got any questions? Right. You, you know one, you can always one, ask one, me a one, question. One, one quick one. Yeah, because, mate. Uh, and we've talked a bit about the brand. But Spaceship is. It's, it's a terrific brand. It's a great name. Uh, it's purple. <laughs> yeah, it's a, a good I, colour, good name, and it, it, and it, it brings out good images. Yeah, and, and it also has that, that image of of going somewhere, yeah, of progress. Totally. Sort of, it, you know, fits with that idea of investing where the world is going. What would you do if you had the spaceship brand and you were able to let let yourself loose on it? I think it's a Richard Branson moment, the whole spaceship thing. I mean, the, the, the first person I think of when you say spaceship brand – what would someone do with it? I think of what would Richard Branson do with it? How would you play with what Bezos is doing at the moment and what all these guys are doing in terms of all this? Their, uh, how would you ambush market, ambush marketing, we use ambush marketing against what Bezos and all those guys are doing with their flights in, into wherever they're going to? Um, and because it's spaceship in itself is very popular at the moment, uh, tr- or space travel. Space travel, yeah. It's very, very yep. popular at the moment. And it's it's sort of the, the two big popular things at the moment are brain, what goes on inside the brain, and space travel. They're the big deals. Um, how can I ambush that? How can I be part of it? We used to do a wizard all the time. We were always ambushing other people's marketing campaigns, always. Um, and ambush marketing is you do it for fun. You don't do it take the piss out of them. You take the piss out of them, but you, you're not going to hurt them anyway. So they would, they, would, they would be cool with it. But how would I play around with that? And, how, and therefore, how would I get my community, the cohort of people who invest with you, to feel part of that fun? And because I think the younger people, they're all going to say, oh, look, at I, I'm part of this thing. Isn't that cool? And, the, and their friends are going to say, oh, part of what? What thing? I'm part of the spaceship. Well, how do I get involved? And it's easy. Yeah, like they become your best salesmen. So ultimately what you're trying to do is how can I get more people, get more customers to enjoy the experience? You've got to get your current customers to share the experience, not the experience of becoming a member, the experience of being part of the spaceship group community. You're going to get more of those people sharing that experience. So how can I make that relevant today, relevant in terms of what else is going on out there in the market sh- marketplace that everyone's talking about? And they're talking about Musk and uh, Bezos. Yeah. And they're talking about spaceships. So, so, so it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a beautiful it's a, alignment. It's so good. Yeah. It's, and if you get it right, it's so powerful. You know, and, and maybe the next time, you know, Bezos is going to put one of his spaceships up there or, so, uh, or Richard Brand's going to put one of his spaceships up or, or Musk is going to put one of his up there. Maybe on that day you can put a little stunt on, a fun stunt on in Martin Place where you could get something that attract the attention of Channel 7 or Channel 9 or Channel 10 or someone uh, who could just talk about it, you know, saying, hey, well, we've got our own spaceship here in Australia and it's, but it's actually called Spaceship and uh, we they're giving this out or they're doing this in Martin Place today. And I just think a bit of fun. I remember when, when Wizard at one stage there, I drove, I didn't drive, but I was on a tank that came into Martin Place. We brought a tank into Martin Place. And um, we used to do crazy shit. Yeah. And I reckon Spaceship's perfectly positioned to do that. It's a great name. I, I would have so much fun with it. I know you would. So much fun with it. I know you would, which is why I wanted to ask you that question because I could <laughs> – and, and even I, just I, then, I, like I, in five I, minutes, I could just immediately see you thinking – Mate, next time you have a little group meeting, tell me and I'll come I'll, and we'll do a little hack with them. Okay. With be ama- that would be amazing. I'd love to do it. Okay. Fantastic. Good on you, Andrew. See you, mate. Thanks a lot.